Well, hey, we just wanted to say thank you for tuning in and watching these teachings. Wherever you're coming from, however you listen, we consider it a real privilege to bring the Word of God to you. And it's been a while for our church since we've been in one of the Gospels, and so this season, we're going to be studying through Mark together because we just feel led to look at the Gospels, learn from Jesus, and be his disciples. So let's go to the teaching together. Um, how many of you know or are aware of the work that our church supports in Mfingano? Anybody know about that in Kenya? Maybe you've heard um, there's a school that we've built over there and there's a group of uh, orphans that we support that people in the church have just generously been given. We kind of uh, created our own little orphan sponsorship program. We don't have any other big organizations helping us, but people just give every month for the education and for the food and all the resources for the kids that are going to the school. And it's just a work that uh, God has enabled us to do as a church through the years. And so it's been amazing to see and to be a part of that. But the last few years, um, we've been praying, just feeling like there's a need for that ministry to become more self-sustaining because it, it exists entirely from the generous giving of people here. And we just thought, man, what if something were to happen to us? Or what if there was a change that needed to be made? We really want to invest uh, in the people there in Kenya in a way where they could sustain the work there with and for themselves. And so what you don't know is this last year, we've made a, a significant investment uh, in the resources to build a farm over there. And uh, the first harvest is coming up really soon. And so I wanna invite us as a church to pray over that harvest because as the crop comes in, um, the food that's grown will be used to feed the students at the school, which will bring the overhead of the ministry down because they have to buy and purchase all the food. Now they can grow it on this farm. And then there's more than enough uh, that's being grown so that some will be able to be sold as a prophet to put back into the school and to build up the ministry. And so the vision for the future is that this would be the first of several farms that would be put together that is a part of this school and the ministry that God's doing there. So really, really cool. Um, as we were praying about, Lord, what would you have us do? God just at the perfect time and in the perfect way like he does brought Vincent uh, along, which if you don't know Vincent, his wife, Boomi, their kids, um, they're a part of the church here. Yeah, you can clap for them. Go for it. Feel free. They deserve it. Uh, amazing family that's been a part of our church here for several years now. And uh, Vincent was willing to go over. He's worked in Africa, has some of these farms and other places, and he helped us get it all set up, hire the right people, get everything in place. So I've asked Vincent to come and pray to lead us as a church in prayer over the work and over the harvest there. So Vincent, why don't you come on up? Anything that you want to share? And then uh, would you please pray? for us and with us. Thank you. Oh, you know, I love these hymns that says, uh, my soul has found the resting place. Uh, my prayer is to see my family being part of this church forever, if it's possible. I, since I joined this church, it's been a blessing. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I want to appreciate Calvary Chapel, uh, those who have left the church and those who are still here for what you are doing in Africa, especially in Kenya. Uh, I... Um, of course, originally, you'll see it in the way I look. <laughs> originally from Africa, specifically from Nigeria, but I was in Kenya last year and I saw the situation there is really there. It's, uh, it's uh, very serious. Uh, 70,000 people on the island, no hospitals. And uh, I was there and I saw this, about 300 kids, amazing kids, without parents, and they were playing soccer barefooted. No, and... They don't even have a soccer boot, or what do you call it now, and shoes. And uh, I was like, who is the best soccer player here? And uh, the guy said, yeah, I'm the best soccer player, and I pay for the uh, boots. And the next day, somebody walked to me and said, what you did yesterday was unfair. And I said, what happened? 
you pay for the best soccer player, but I'm the best keeper. <laughs> so I got to pay for that too. And you see, I have over 250 people others playing without a soccer boots. And I asked them, what two, just mention two things you would like us to get for you. And they said, oh, we need books. And so Pastor, uh, the library here actually donated some books and they asked me to come for more. But I have not been there because uh, we also need to raise the resources to ship these books back to them. Hopefully when I'm going back this year, I'll be able to take it along. And uh, so they need our help, even though we are transitioning uh, from being active uh, monthly support to them. But this is the time they need, really need our help and they need our prayers. So shall we pray for them? Faithful Father, we just want to thank you. First of all, for giving us your son Jesus that has brought this cord of oneness between us and the people over there in Africa. Some of them don't even look like us, but you created them in your image, in your likeness. And we thank you for giving us Calvary Chapel that have been a blessing around the world, and especially to this uh, ministry in Kenya. Father, for those who have contributed over the years and the entire church, we pray. The Bible says those who watered shall be watered. Those who give will receive in return. And I pray for these families that you bless them in return for what they have done in your name because they have denied themselves to be able to support others. I pray you open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there won't be enough room in these homes, in this family to absorb. Father, I pray, even as we transition from the work we've been doing over the years to support this ministry in Kenya, I pray you raise help for the ministry, for those who are working on the farm, for Allen, for Pascal, for Vidalis, and you will send laborers even to the harvest over there, the harvest of souls, and every other needs. You will level every mountain. You will fill up every valley. You will make every crooked way to be smooth, every undulating way to be, to be straight. You will raise divine epas of destiny for those kids. You will show them how much you love them. You will send help from every corners of the globe to this ministry. And the work that we have started there will not die. And Father, Isaac, the Bible says, sow in the land. And that very year, reap a hundredfold. That is our prayer for the project going on there. That our effort there shall not be wasted. And ultimately, these people will grow up to love you, to know you, to serve you, and even to disciple others. Once again, we thank you. And we ask that when the time shall come, you will remember this and show us your mercy and release your blessings upon us. All this we ask for in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Sometimes I just feel like we could come, Vincent could pray for us, and we could go, and we'd be fine. So thank you for your prayers, Vincent. Thank you for all your work and your gifts on this project. And thank you for just being a generous church in so many ways and, and being a part of the work that God's doing here and, and in other parts of the world. So God wants to work now. He wants to speak to us through his word. So would you open your Bibles to Mark chapter one? And uh, Pastor Aaron is gonna come and share the word with us this morning. Thank you. That's right. About 38 minutes ago, we sang a song and we said, Jesus, this Jesus, he can change your life. Remember that? That was, that was 30, 38 minutes ago. Some of us have a short memory, but I'm just bringing it back. That encourages me. Let me tell you about my Jesus, because he can change your life. And so I'm really encouraged uh, to be able to sing that with you folks. 
And I want to just pray for that because, you know, sometimes we can start and we can, we can get into something before we ask the Lord for his help. And so I want to pray right now. Jesus, Lord, I need your help. God, we want to hear from you. We want you to change our lives, Lord. We need your spirit to move in this room for you to bless us, to open our understanding, to open up our eyes, Lord, to hear from you and receive direction from you. Lord, change our lives. We ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever been in a situation where your reaction to that situation did not match the situation? Right? I know we can see this in other people like, hey, whoa, that was an overreaction or don't you care about this? Come on, get excited. But when we look back at ourselves, which I'd like to do this morning, try to understand why our reaction does not measure up to the situation that we're in. And so for help here, I did a little uh, couple of AI drawings just to help kind of put this out. Now, I've removed all the names and uh, times so that you don't know that they're mostly me. I can't figure out how to build this darn shelf. They obviously designed it wrong on purpose, those guys, because, I mean, I'm smart. I should know how to build a, a shelf, right? But uh, I'm not going to tell you that I'm insecure about that, and I don't feel strong about my ability. Uh, I like your new haircut. Oh, it's all about my looks, isn't it? Okay, all right. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I understand she's got a, a body image thing, but it's because she has six fingers on her left hand that's like, whoa, she started out a little bit with a, a tough life here. <coughs> just trying to measure up there. And then the last one here, uh, I just wish we could, uh, we could buy a new couch. Oh, I see how it is. I don't earn enough money, and I'm not a good provider. So I bet you just marry you. wish you had married Jake, huh? I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm good enough. I don't feel like something, I feel like something's wrong. The reaction there is just not matching. And so a couple of weeks ago, when we were going through Mark, I have to tell you guys, we were going through Mark uh, chapter one, and uh, we went through verses uh, 135 through 38. And I was reading this, and I had a reaction. And I'm gonna tell you about my reaction, but I wanna read the scripture first and tell you that I'm not the only one that had this reaction. So Mark 1, 35 through 38. And by the way, Zach did a good job of telling us why Jesus said this and why Jesus did this. The message was the most important part of the mission. All right, so we start there. We understand why, but sometimes the why doesn't measure up to our feelings. And I'm just gonna tell you that I had a feeling on this one. And we'll get into this. Verse 35. And rising up very early in the morning, this was Jesus, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. So Jesus gets up very, very early. Peter is telling this story to Mark, and he's remembering, hey, there was this one time where Jesus, we were doing stuff, ministry. We were doing some good stuff in this town, Galilee here. It was, we just healed my mom, and, and everything was going well, and then he disappeared. He disappeared. What happened? We got up early, verse 36. Simon, this is Peter, and those who were with him searched for him. So they're, what's going on? 37, and they found him and they said to him, uh, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. Overreaction. Everybody is looking for you. And he said to them, let's go to the next town that I may preach there also, for this is why I came out. Again, the message he had to get the message out. That's what was the most important thing for Jesus at this point. But I started to feel like, ooh, you're just going to move on? What? Don't, don't we, things are going good. We're just kind of getting HQ set up here. People are coming. They're being healed. Demons are being cast out. People are, are hearing the message. Why do we have to go on down the road? Why does it feel like Jesus is just moving on? And that was the feeling I had. 
does it feel like Jesus is just kind of moving on? So I threw in some more scriptures, and I want to go through these scriptures with you at a pretty high clip. So if I don't go too fast, I'll just tell you them, and we can connect afterwards about the numbers. Luke 7, 19. Now, this is John the Baptist. You remember John the Baptist? He sends two of his guys, calling two of his disciples, he said to him, and sent them to the Lord, sent them to Jesus, saying, are you the one who's to come, or is there somebody else? Because I'm stuck in prison, and this doesn't feel great. Does this, is this the plan, Jesus? Come on, you're moving on. You left me here. Remember the baptism and everything? And then, whew, I, not only is it you're gone, but I'm in prison. John 13, 36 through 37. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Again, Lord, can't we just stay here? But Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Don't you know what it's worth? This is Peter. Don't you know how, how valuable it is to hang out with me? Why can't we stay here? But Jesus says, this is the route. This is the mission. I came to tell everybody the good news. John 14, three through six. Jesus is answering his disciples. He says, if I go to prepare a place for you, which he told them he was gonna prepare a place for them, I will come again and I will take you to my side, to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. And poor Thomas kind of gets the brunt of this sometimes, but I sometimes feel this too. Thomas said to him, verse five, Lord, we do not, where, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus tries to answer their question and calm their hearts. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but me, but by me, except through me. Okay, you've got some promises here. And Jesus, the whole time, he's telling his disciples, look, we're, we're on a mission. They're not getting it totally, but they're, he's on a mission. And he's going to fulfill his mission. Now, <clears throat> so that we can finish the story, I'm going to read a couple more verses here so that I can know solidly, okay, this is the story, and this is how it finished. Because right now, we're, we're right in the middle of the disciples and us, if you will, me and the disciples. Uh, gosh, I don't want to put myself. Me, like one of the disciples, uh, is, is wrestling. Jesus, seems like you're moving. Seems like you're moving. Seems like you're moving on. And I, I don't want to get left behind. It's John 14, 15 through 17. Jesus gives them this, the instructions. This is what I'm going to do for you. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and in you. So he's given like a preview. I know that I'm headed in this direction. But I'm going to tell you that God's going to provide for you. And he's going to provide this helper to be with you and in you. Now, in you, you can't separate. So, okay, I'm, I'm feeling that. What does that mean, Jesus? And then John 19, 30. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a cold yesterday. <clears throat> And somebody gave me a tea. So thank you. John 19, 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At this point, Jesus finishes his mission on earth to get the word out and to prove his love for us by taking that message and pinning it up on the cross so that it could be from here on out, everybody could know this mission, this message. His, message. his mission would be completed at this point. 
Remember the promise that he gave. We celebrated Easter a couple weeks ago. About 50 days after Easter, we celebrate Pentecost, which is this thing where the disciples are gathered in an upper room and they're, they're seeking God. Well, God, what do you have for us? Because Jesus told them, wait for, this, wait for the Spirit to come. And the Spirit descends on this group of, of believers, people who believe Jesus' word, take him at his word, follow him. And the Spirit comes and it begins to move in power. And it begins to move in such a way that it's undeniable. And you see the evidence of this in Acts 2, 37 and 38. Peter, um, compelled by the Holy Spirit, starts preaching. And the other apostles start preaching. And people are bewildered. They don't know what's going on. They cannot argue. They cannot define what's happening. They just have to move in, in, a, uh, in a way to figure out what's going on. In a way, the questions are coming. In verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter and the rest of the apostles <clears throat> they said to them, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? Give us direction. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And 3,000 people were saved that day. When the Spirit moves that first day, he moves in such power. And he moves with such direction. And he fills the apostles, he fills the believers who have given their, <clears throat> given Jesus lordship in their life. Okay. So I know that's the story. Jesus had a mission and he had to keep, 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 keep moving on to get that mission completed. Finally, he finishes the mission on the cross and fulfills his promise to send the Holy Spirit to be with us and in us so that we're never left. We should not have a feeling of Jesus is gone. He left me behind. That's what I know. And sometimes what you know gets interrupted by what you feel. And for me, this is what I felt a couple of weeks ago when we read this scripture, I started to connect to this feeling, <clears throat> man, there's a good thing going. There's a good thing going, Jesus. Why won't we just stay here, set up camp? Let's, let's really see what we can do and then we can move on. But, and, 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 and the other thing I share with Peter, like, but, but isn't it worth it to stay here with me? Now I'm making it personal, right? Now I'm starting to feel, oh, what if Jesus moves on from me? And I'm thinking, oh, okay, this is, this is an interesting reaction and I needed to check it because uh, what I'm actually hearing myself say is, Dad, why are, where are you going? <laughs> why, why do you gotta leave? And so I wanna share, you guys, share with you guys the work, some of the work I did and some of the story that I have, my story, to help make sense of this. When I was about two years old, <clears throat> my mom and uh, dad, they separated. And they separated because, uh, you know, at two years old, you don't know why people do things. that they, You're very, very, very hard to grasp anything like that. You're affected by it. But it's hard to understand it. And at two years old, I could not tell you why my, my uh, mother and father had a completely irreconcilable situation. They could not continue on. But at 10 years old, I started to put a little bit together. And I had a visit <clears throat> with my biological father, who I really didn't see. But I had a visit with him at 10 years old, and things started to make a little bit of sense to me. Because I started, uh, it was over at my aunt's house and we were having, a, a, you know, an afternoon. <clears throat> and I got to spend this afternoon with this guy who's my father or biological father, whatever you want to, his father, dad. And we're wrestling and we're talking about Legos and everything 10-year-olds talk about. Empire Strikes Back and things like that. Big, big deals. And uh, 
Things are going great. Have a dinner. Oh, you eat food too? Cool, all right. I'm getting to know you. This is what a father-son relationship should be like. And everything's going pretty good. And again, 10-year-old mind. And till it's time for him to leave. Then something changed in me. Where are you going? Wait, what? What's? And I can't remember much, except the waterworks just started, and I just kind of collapsed, and was inconsolable for a little while. Ten years old. I don't know. How come you're going? I thought this was good. Why can't we continue this? What did I do wrong? Now. That's a 10-year-old mind. Much later in life, <clears throat> I was able to kind of spend some time back in figuring this out. And, and now I can look back and easily tell you, well, easily, effectively tell you, yeah, I think these kind of things go pretty deep for folks. Rejection and, and uh, trying to figure out your place in a relationship. What I know is that my mom was steadfast and faithful. and She cared for me. She took care of me. She stayed. And eventually, when I was about five years old, a man came into our life who decided to stay with us. And he came into our life, and he chose to be a good husband to my mom, and he chose to be a father to me. And God showed me this redemptive story where I was chosen, particularly by somebody who didn't have to. Somebody didn't have to choose, but they chose me and my mom. And my mom's steadfast, faithful love has shown me and my dad's faithfulness to be in and stay with me and stay with our family showed me that God's mercy was on my life. Because I can look and I can say, well, that's, that's the redemption, that's the story. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> preparing for something like this, to tell <clears throat> 300, 400 people your story, it's a little, a little, little, <sighs> a little uh, <clears throat> t- uh, testing. But I know all of you guys have stories. If not the same story, worse or better, somewhere in here, Somebody has already told me after service, that was me. I know that we all have stories. And, and so what do I got to do? I got to take this story before the Lord. And I take this story and I say, God, what was that? And he shows me, look, I, here's what the truth is. This was the route and this was the better route. But sometimes it doesn't make it all the way down to my heart. And I need to tell my heart to listen. And so in this case, that's why I read all those scriptures Look, Jesus had a mission, and it may have felt like he was just going, 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 and leaving us behind, but the mission was bigger. The mission was bigger. The message had to get out. You and I are here today because the message got out. That's a much better story than if the thing had just stayed in that little fishing village and stopped. So when God is on the move, Sometimes I have to remind myself, he's not just moving on from me. He's moving because there's a purpose. So I understand it. I agree with it. Sometimes I do have these feelings that come up and I have to to measure them. I have to uh, kind of expose them, put them under sunlight and say, Lord, show me me what's really going on here. And I know that some of you here today have your stories, but I also know that some of you here today have decisions and you have things you have to make um, <laughs> sense of. Some bad stuff, some good stuff, but you need help in understanding how to make those decisions. What should I decide? What should I do? Jesus, I want to go where you are, but I want to feel like I'm valued. I want to feel like I'm safe. I want to feel like you're here. I've told you I'm going to be in you and with you. Okay, measured. So what do I know? I know that Jesus made the way. I saw it. 
that was laid out, laid out in the scriptures, finished at the cross, and then fulfilled by the Holy Spirit coming. I know that the Holy Spirit is with us and in us to help and guide us. Okay, all right, I know that. Sometimes, what if I, I don't feel it. Sometimes I, I, I might just catch myself losing a little footing. You know, I, I, I know what's right, I know, but I, oh, man. I can tell you three things you do not want to do when the Holy Spirit comes and talks to you. When the Holy Spirit's pressing on you, the Bible tells us three ways that we do not, do not want to respond to the Holy Spirit. One, we do not want to resist the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's coming to you. Hey, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. And you put out the stiff arm. No, I'm good. I'm good. I don't, I don't think I'm ready to do that. That would be resisting the Holy Spirit. He's pushing to come in and, and be with you, and you resist. The next thing would be grieving the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit would be something <clears throat> like, hey, that's a good idea, Holy Spirit. Um, I like where you're thinking, but I've got a better plan. I think I've got some other ideas. I'm going to try them first, and then I'll come back to you <clears throat> and see how they didn't work as well as yours. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't agree necessarily that the Holy Spirit has the right plan. So that would be grieving the Holy Spirit. And then that last one, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Over and over again, I just had like Sprite commercials in my head. The thirst quencher, don't quench the Spirit. If you just take a little drink and you are thirsty, you don't get quenched. You don't get filled. You don't get all that he's offering. And so we don't want to slow him down and say, Lord, I love what you're doing. And uh, <clears throat> Holy Spirit, I know you really want me to go and do this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about it for a while. I'm going to pre-plan. I'm going to maybe just take a small step into it, but not really dive in. That would be quenching the spirit. These are things we do not want to do. What do we want to do? In order to connect to what the Holy Spirit has for us, remember that power that came on that first day? 3,000 people, bewildered, unable to explain what was going on, seeing the works of God happening right in front of them, the power of the Holy Spirit working. What do we do? We speak to him. We pray, Lord, take some time, pray, Lord, what do, you, what, do you, what do you have for me? Because I know what I have for me. What do you have for me? What do you want me to do? Where are you going to lead me? And when you go there, please tell me how to follow you. Please tell me how to be with you. Second, search for him. If you have trouble finding somebody, just like Peter did, everybody's looking for you. You go and you search. If it's important, you will search. You will find. Search for him. Read the word. I can <clears throat> tell you that we read the, all those scriptures again on purpose because there it is lined out in red, black, and white. This is the story. This is how it goes. We know it's written. We know it's true. Read his word. I cannot tell you how many times I'm struggling with something, trying to figure it out, and I'll be reading through a passage of scripture that I've read before, and something just hits me differently. If you read the word consistently, you will reap the rewards. The other thing, talk to spirit-filled men and women. <clears throat> If you're searching for an answer for something, you want God to speak into your life. You want him to move in your world. Find somebody, and you're not finding it. Find somebody who you do see the Spirit working in their world. Find somebody who you respect their walk with the Lord, and you know that they are um, being directed by the Spirit of God. Find them, talk to them, pray with them, ask them, hey, what do you think God would have me do in this situation? The responsibility is still yours to take it to the Lord. 
but get advice from people who are filled with the Spirit. Okay, and then here's another, uh, check your reaction on this. Okay, so if I hear from the Lord what to do, what if he tells me to go to Africa? I'm not ready for that, right? I'm not sure. Let's send Vincent. (laughs) Excuse me. What if he asks me to to talk to that person? What if he asks me to have a conversation and confront somebody about something they're doing? A sin in their life that's so obvious and they can't see it. Or maybe they do and they're resisting the Spirit's work in their life. What do I do if he tells me what to do? Because I don't want to disobey him And the easiest way to not disobey is to not ask for instruction, right? (laughs) Dangerous. Okay, we do know one thing. I'll say, uh, uh, actually, in praying through this this uh, this um, trip that we sent Vincent on, we we we've been working on that for years, trying to figure out like how are we gonna how do how do we do this? How do we help these folks become self sufficient? And we prayed about it, and we prayed about it, and there was not an answer yet. We just kept praying. And eventually, God brought a conversation between Vince and I, and we eventually felt to send him over, and then he came back with this observation. And the Spirit of God moved into this situation and just answered the question that we'd been praying for for years. God will do that on any situation. God, what do I do about my... my uh, my son or my daughter? God, what do I do about my, uh, my daily habits? God, what do I do about my deficiencies? What do I do about this cancer? What do I do about anything? I don't know if you guys realize he's ready to give answers all day long. But you have to ask. You have to ask. You have to actually want to know what God wants you to do so that he can give you the best thing for your world, for your life. No matter how big or how small it is, he's interested in every aspect of it. So Lord, do I need to go to Africa? Maybe. Maybe I'll need to go to Ecuador. Maybe I'll need to go to Safeway. Maybe I'll just need to go talk to my wife. Maybe I'll need to go talk to my friend. There's no, there's no height or depth that he's not available for. One, one thing that we do know without a doubt is that when Jesus finished his mission, he came back and he told his disciples, hey, now that my part of the mission's done, I've got a part for you. That's me and you. I've got a part for you. I'm going to send the Spirit. Boom. And here's one of the major things that he's going to do. Remember, the mission is still the message. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus is about to ascend up into heaven to be with his Father to prepare a place for us. And he says, verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Always. That go, therefore, is as you're going, wherever you're going, round in circles, wherever you're going, I'm going to be there with you. And the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit is with you. As you go in everything that you do, 
my work, my life, my friends, my family, my relationships. As you go, tell them about me. Tell them about who I am to you. Tell them about my story in your life. That part is is crystal clear. We have a mission. Like I said before, sometimes, you know, uh, when you share a story, and I I was preparing to share this story uh, for a couple of days, and then I got a cold, which is just perfect timing. I look around this room now, you know, as I was preparing, there was nobody in this room. I could just see chairs. There's an empty chair right there. Okay. Now when I kind of see faces in the chairs, I know that there's stories. I know that there's issues. I know that people want desperately for God to answer questions in their lives. I know there's different stories. There's different problems that each one of us are facing. And there's different things that we keep telling ourselves, God, I know this, I know this, but boy, it's hard to get down here sometimes. There's struggles that everyone in this room is going through. And so as we close the service now, I want to spend some time asking the Spirit to move. I don't want to just get up and go. I want to spend a couple of minutes praying. Lord, I, I, I need some information. Lord, I need an answer. Lord, I need to confirm the feeling against what I know. Would you guys pray with me? ask for your spirit. Right now we know that you're here. God, you can move and you've promised your spirit is in us. Lord, move in power. So many requests, Lord, in this room. So many questions. So many stories. Lord, help us now. bringing, Lord, you have the strength, you have all authority, you have all power, you know how to fix a situation we don't know how to, Lord. Speak, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Lord, convict a sin where we're out of alignment with you Lord convict by your spirit Lord where there's a question allow us to bring it to you Father a good good Father will never leave heartedness we're only halfway in Lord I pray that you would draw Lord draw us in all the way
allow us to trust that you will be faithful. All of those fears have enough to overcome, Lord. All those doubts, will you be enough? God, I pray your spirit would answer that question right now. Jesus is enough. It is finished. The work is finished. The hard part sometimes is believing it was for us. Lord, show your love. The evidence of your mercy in our lives, God, move powerfully on these people. given to you, Lord. We praise your name. We praise the holy name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for speaking. Remind us that we can come to you at any time. Bring to remembrance the stories of where you have saved us and you have protected us, Lord, so that we can lean on you. Like we know that we can. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Praise you, Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, what a gift the Gospels are as we get to look into the life of Jesus and see God dwelling among us, real flesh and blood, a, a human being just like us. And I hope that these teachings will inspire you and us to really pray and think through uh, as we learn from Jesus what it looks like to be his disciples in everyday life. And so, Wherever you're watching, we're in this together. That's our goal is to be fully formed and to become more like him. So thanks for watching.